Okay. So welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining this. I know it was a bit short notice, but it's um, you know really appreciated that you've joined. Um, this is training on the skin tear pathway, hopefully what you're expecting. Um, quite an exciting piece of work that we're rolling out um, within the nursing, dual registered, and then eventually the residential homes as well. Um, so we will go through today, we'll not only look at the pathway and the treatment, but we will also consider um, how we may reduce incidence of skin tears as well and then we'll talk to you about um, your skin tear boxes that you're going to be delivered um, and how you know that's all going to tie in and work. And we've got Pete here from H&R as well um, and H&R are the company that make the dressing that is on this pathway and Pete's very kindly put together the skin tear boxes um, and also will be delivering those out to you. OK, so just to get going, um, so the aim of today, we're going to look at um, how we introduce the skin tear pathway um, and improve, therefore, the management of skin tears. But also, hopefully, we can actually reduce the prevalence of them as well. So stopping them sort of, um, you know, taking place in, in the first place. Our main learning objectives are we'll look at the definition of a skin tear um, and also some visual aids as well of how we classify skin tears because they can classify under three types and that's sort of dependent on their severity. So hopefully you'll get an understanding of that, an understanding of those who are at risk of skin tears. Um, and we'll also look at ways of how we may prevent skin tears, but also if a patient does develop a skin tear, how we would follow the treatment pathway um, once we We've identified this and also just thinking a bit more about the effects of skin tears on the patient and the organisation. So basically, the definition of a skin tear um, is that it's a traumatic wound caused by mechanical forces, which includes the removal of adhesives, and it is a partial or complete separation of the outer skin layers from the inner tissue. Um, so that photograph there, you can see someone who sustained a skin tear on their hand. Um, and actually, where do they occur? So they can actually occur on any part of the body, but most often they are found on the upper or lower limbs and the dorsal aspect of the hands. And it's actually 70 to 80 percent that occur on the hands or arms. So that's, um, you know, a very high um, amount of them that are on the hands and arms. And the common causes of them would be shearing and friction forces, um, any blunt trauma, falls. So those patients, residents that are at more risk of falls um, will be at more risk of skin tears. Um, linking in with that, their poor mobility if we're, you know, moving and handling, if we've got poor moving and handling technique, any injuries from equipment um, and also removal of those adhesive dressings as well can be a cause. And then thinking about those um, patients, residents who are at higher risk, um, unfortunately, it's going to be people that you're sort of coming across very often. So the elderly, it's a big risk factor, basically because the normal um, ageing process causes some changes in the skin. Um, and this makes it more fragile, makes it more vulnerable and susceptible to damage. Um, and therefore, less force is required to cause that trauma injury, such as a skin tear. Um, so on top of, you know, the elderly who will naturally have more fragile um, at risk skin, it's also going to be those who require increased assistance with their activities of daily living. So if you're having to do um, sort of a lot of work with them in terms of bathing, dressing, assisting with their mobility or even using things like hoists, um, then that is going to increase their risk as well. Um, some um, patients and residents also have dry and or thin tissue paper skin. So that's not just because they're elderly and their skin is changing. They may well already have, um, you know, quite dry skin, which puts them at risk. A history of skin tears, um, which may also involve the fact that they have some scarring. So, so where that skin is scarred, it will have sort of less integrity than your sort of normal skin. Um, but obviously, of course, if you've ever had a history of skin, tears the likelihood is you could go on to develop another um, patients and residents who are acutely unwell and also those who are confused and or aggressive so just thinking a bit about the aging skin, just because that is a significant risk factor um, of why um, someone may develop skin tears. So this is just showing what happens with our skin as we age um, and unfortunately it's not really 
aging as such because the changes start at the age of 40 so not even particularly old at all um, but what you can see sort of happen through that continuum is that as it as we get older our skin dries um, it also the ph on the surface of the skin changes and this is linked with a, uh, a breakdown of our skin barrier so our skin barrier is there to stop sort of irritants and bacteria kind of coming in um, and also keeps the moisture locked in as well to make our skin sort of nice and hydrated um, but what happens is those ph changes as we get older that will actually affect um, how well the barrier is able to work and that means it is more susceptible to irritants um, getting in and also moisture loss as well so we have decreased skin integrity um, a reduce a re um, reduction in natural moisturizing factors and poorer water holding capacity as well um, so yeah they those are all things that happen as our skin ages which is what makes it more susceptible to damage and that's not just skin tears that's sort of other elements of damage as well, but skin tears being one of them. So thinking about how we may prevent that to, um, in the first place then, particularly when we know, you know, those those people that are at risk, what can we do to, to help prevention? So completing a holistic assessment of your patient, um, thinking in particular about your moving and handling risk assessment. Um, so making sure that there's correctly fitted equipment, removing any unnecessary hazards or furniture, um, considering pad protectors, for example, over your bed rails, and then also wheelchair arms and leg support so if we we are having to do a lot of moving and handling for a patient um, or a resident it we need to make sure that that risk assessment is thorough skin condition as well so just generally thinking about the condition of our patient's skin um, check their history their past medical history um, any medications they're on that could have an impact on their skin and also just physically how it appears that's going to tell us a lot we'll we'll be able to tell if it's dry if it's very fragile very thin um, it looks poorly hydrated just from um, our eyes in which case we know that that skin is more at risk thinking about also their fluid and nutrition um, hydration is a big one. As I said, we just um, naturally get it's easier to lose that um, that moisture and that water um, as as the skin sort of ages. So trying to keep your patient sort of hydrated um, and also making sure that they've got good nutrition on board as well. So we may need to consider the must um, and also thinking about things such as balance charts and food charts if we have specific concerns regarding our patients and residents. Um, using things like paper tape on the skin to reduce trauma. Um, and I would say, I mean, it doesn't even just stop at paper tape it's thinking about if you're using things with a strong adhesive component is there an alternative is it absolutely necessary that you use those adhesives on the skin because they will put the skin at more risk of trauma um, and as we were talking about areas where you're at more risk of damage thinking about covering those up if possible so using long sleeves um, long sleeve tops and trousers if that is suitable okay and a big one, so uh, slide on its own, just because skincare is a huge one, as I've talked about sort of ageing skin and what happens as our skin gets older um, is a huge risk factor for skin tears. So um, sort of skin management is, uh, is a big part of prevention. So we would suggest that for all patients and residents, emollient is used as a soap substitute when washing. So any of their nice perfume soaps that they like, unfortunately, they are going to have an impact on the pH of the skin, which is what then um, contributes to further breakdown of that natural skin barrier. So that is why we would say emollients are the best thing to use dissolved in the water as a soap substitute. So it should be a greasy ointment type emollient. Um, and then after that, we would say to after dry trying to moisturise the skin with an emollient also. The ideal would be twice a day. We understand that that's maybe not always um, something that's achievable, but once um, is going to be, you know, better management than nothing at all. Um, so it should be a vital part of their skincare. It should be part of their sort of, um, sort of washing and um, cleansing regime, really, with their personal care. Um, it 
it will promote their skin health and also certain emollients, ones that contain urea, um, for instance, will help to lock in that moisture that will naturally be lost in that elderly sort of skin or those skin, um, those skins that are drier in some patients. Um, this application, so emollient use alone, has been shown to um, reduce the incidence of skin tears by up to 50%. So it's a huge, huge impact that it has just by good emollient use. Um, and at the bottom there is the skin barrier management pathway. So this pathway, um, I, I'm aware you won't be able to probably read all the small boxes there, but this pathway is available on our website under the resources tab. Um, but essentially, everything that I've discussed there with emollient use is on the left hand side, the far left, where it's sort of green, yellow and says prevention. Um, and that's it's just basically what we advocate for all good management of skin, emollient as a soap and then putting a leave on emollient after drying. Um, and then as it goes through the continuum of the pathway, it also considers patients who may be at risk of moisture associated damage as well and what products we may need to introduce to, to help mitigate that. Um, but as a general consensus of, you know, your standard good skincare practices, emollient use is, is really key. OK, so that's sort of covered those that are at risk and what we can do to think about prevention. Unfortunately, though, there will be those patients and residents that will sustain a skin tear. Um, so just wanting to think about, you know, once you've got that, that wound in front of you, sort of what you're looking at and things that you need to consider. So this guidance will be um, attached as such. It will come with your pathway um, in your skin tear boxes. So there will be that prompt there to kind of remind you. It's not stuff that I'm just expecting you to be able to um, um, remember and like I say these these slides will also be available on our website as well to refer back to um, but essentially when we're looking at any wound not just skin tear we need to be thinking about the times framework um, just to think about what our sort of um, plan is um, and so that we can set appropriate treatment goals and optimize the management of the wound so our T um, stands for tissue so you would need to just be looking at your wound bed thinking about the tissue that present there hopefully with your acute skin tears you're mainly going to just be seeing the epithelialization and granulation that nice healthy pink red tissue but we do need to consider if you've also got slough or necrosis um, that, that they are tissues that are dead they require debridement removal um, as appropriate because they're not conducive to healing so thinking about what you've got present there and what your overall goal is i stands for infection um, so again, with skin tears, it is to be mindful that it's different to inflammation. So with often with acute wounds, um, even if you or I were to sustain a skin tear or some sort of trauma wound, there would naturally be an, a slight element of sort of redness around the edge. And it's that normal inflammatory reaction that your body has to with an acute wound. Um, but what we do need to consider, though, is, you know, past that, beyond that, if there then is showing signs of wound bed infection. So a tool that's really useful to help um, consider and diagnose wound bed infection is the AMBLE tool and that stands for the assessment and management of bacterial loading in wounds and that is also available on our website under the resources tab um, and it basically just outlines some of the signs and symptoms to look out for and therefore what the management should be um, in those instances because the pathways is very straightforward and it's just use of one dressing but if we've got other things going on like infection then that's when we're going to need to change our management um, and the tool kind of guides you on on what dressings so antimicrobial dressings that should be used in those instances m um, stands for your moisture so we always just need to consider that we're having a good moisture balance with our wound beds. Um, often you may have patients or residents who feel that actually the wound would be better off if it was exposed to air. Um, but actually it's it's not good for a wound to be too wet, but also not to try and dry it out completely. We need a level of moisture in the wound bed to aid um, that healing. So we want to make sure that there's adequate moisture, but that it's also being controlled so that it's not very wet leaking through dressings, etc. Um, e is your edge. So 
a wound will always heal from the edge inwards. So if you've got a poorly managed edge of your wound, then you're unlikely to um, see sort of very good progress with the healing. So what we would say is have a look at your edge and consider how healthy it is if it's um, you know vulnerable if it's macerated or if it's very dry and trying to combat those things um, to try and optimize your wound edge to, to aid the healing and then the rest of your skin as well is is really important so not just at the edge but what is going on with the rest of the skin um, I would assume that if they've sustained that skin tear they may well already have sort of quite thin fragile skin and it's just then considering that um, and what sort of needs to be done or things like skin conditions or any allergies that they have okay so when we thought about our wound bed there is a way to classify your skin tears which i mentioned earlier so there are three types type one type two type three and on the far right you'll see pictures um, just showing the types this will also be part of um, the guidance that's included with your pathway in the boxes so again it's just a reminder so that people aren't forgetting how to classify or what what skin tears come under what classification so type one um, it's essentially looking at the the skin flap that's um, sustained from the skin tear um, and type one would be where you've had no sort of flap or skin loss at all so you know when they've sustained that skin tear either you know there's no sort of flap that's come back or you are able to replace the flap entirely over the wound bed so that there's no exposed wound bed if you see what I mean so on the right on the far right um, picture you'll see that it looks very linear um, that flap has been completely repositioned over the wound bed and there's nothing exposed there so that's your type one that's your most simple sort of skin tear type two is um, as you can see in the picture there is some wound bed exposed so you have got partial flap loss there so you've either um, lost some of that flap or you've been able to fully reposition that flap completely over the wound bed um, so there is some exposed that's type two and then type three is your most complex um, sort of skin tear. That's when you've got complete flap loss. So as you can see there, there's no skin flap. You're unable to replace anything over the wound bed. You've got an entirely exposed wound bed. Um, so that's just quite important to, to think about your documentation of that and just help to consider as well that the type three will be probably more complex, more um sort of slower to heal than your, your type one. Okay, so the pathway itself, um, like I say, you will get the, the skin tear classification and the guidance on times, and you will get this main copy of the pathway. It will all be on one um, large um, sheet, but I've had to break it up just for the purpose of you being able to see this on the slides. So um, some your resident or patient will sustain a skin tear, you will need to do your assessment. And again, that's where we say just to consider your times framework. Um, of course, any bleeding that needs controlling, do so by applying light pressure. Um, hopefully you won't have sort of uncontrollable bleeding, but if there is um, quite a bit of bleeding, you'd obviously need to control that first and then just cleanse using normal tap water. So there's no evidence to suggest that it requires any sterile water and warm tap water is absolutely fine to use. Um, and then the so the main element of the first aid as such is immediately trying using a damp glove finger to replace that skin flap over the wound bed as best as you can. So with that, don't use any sort of unnecessary force. Don't use any extra instruments like forceps, just a damp gloved finger to replace that over as best as you can so if it's causing we don't you know we don't want to be causing the patient or resident any pain um, or like i say doing it with any force but getting that covered back over and then from then you'd be able to classify your skin tear so understanding if it's type one type two or type three and we would recommend documenting that and then when it comes to dressing the wound it is essentially just covering over with one dressing so it's called the clinoderm foam silicone border um, 
and you would cover that over and then you would be able to reassess your wound as and when. And like I said, the guidance will be available on how you classify and also how you assess to remind you. Um, but just to show you a bit clearer and then we can talk about the actual dressing. This is essentially very similar to how your dressing will look if you look at those right hand side pictures. You've got um, a nice sort of bordered dressing. So with the clinoderm foam silicone border, there is silicone that covers the entire dressing. Um, so, you know, not just the, the border, but the centre as well. And that silicone acts like a contact layer. So there's no need for any extra contact layers before you put the dressing on. You don't need any atrauma or trichotex. Um, it is all built in. Um, there is a level of absorbency because it's got some absorbent fibres in it and it's also the the central um, island is foam um, and the edge although it's adhesive because of being the silicone it's a very very gentle adhesive so it's very kind to the skin um, it's very different from a lot of the adhesives that are currently on the formulary um, that you do have access to that we probably wouldn't recommend to use on skin tears um, this is something that is suitable and very kind and gentle and atraumatic um, so what we would say is when you place that dressing on the things to consider are um, is just uh, arrowing it to make sure that people know in what direction they should remove it essentially because what we don't want to be doing is popping it over the skin tear and then someone comes and removes it and they're pulling the dressing and pulling the skin flat back as well at the same time um, so what we would say is draw the arrow so that it's um, with the direction of the skin flap so like you can see there I think the diagram shows it nice and clearly you can see that that flap is kind of pointing downwards and that's the direction in which you would remove the dressing if just consider if you were to flip that arrow upwards and you were to remove the dressing in that direction then you're also going to be pulling the skin flap away so it's just to, to think about that um, and the reason we say to arrow it is basically because the dressing is um, absolutely suitable to be left in place up to seven days um, and it can be removed so you can lift the corner have a look at your wound bed to reassess it and then you can actually replace the dressing back down um, you don't need a new one it will just stick back down and that then can be left for seven days and then after that we would advise changing it so um, as well as arrowing the dressing it's probably worth putting a date on there as well just so people are aware when it's due the change or when it was first put on so people can count um, seven days after that we would say that there will be some instances where you may need to change it sooner um, so if the extra day or the blood um, is not being properly contained within the dressing so if that central pad is more than three quarters sort of full of extra date um, then we would say it would need changing sooner or if you've reassessed your wound and you're concerned about the wound so it looks like there's signs of wound bed infection um, whereby you may need to consider other primary dressings then obviously we need to to change that but essentially otherwise you would put pop your dressing on you can lift the corner reassess it every two to three days and then just replace the dressing back down um pete i don't know if you want to show everyone if i stop sharing for a mo just so people can have a little look, look at you using the dressing um one second it's gonna let me Okay, I've just stopped presenting um, and then you'll be able to see Pete a bit closer. Okay, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Hello everybody. I'm Pete uh, Kingsley from H&R Healthcare and this is the Clinoderm Foam Silicon Dressing which will be included in your skin tear boxes, a box of five seven and a half by seven and a half and a box of five ten by tens. Uh, as Lauren said it's uh, well it's actually a five layer dressing you've got a vapor permeable polyurethane film on the top that stops your nasty microorganisms from getting in and gives the dressing its shower proof quality then we release the backing paper so the silicon covers the whole of the dressing it's over the pad and the adhesive border as well Inside those two layers, you've got foam, you've got a few super absorbent fibres. It doesn't hold as much exudate as a super absorbent. They just help to lock the exudate away that it does hold. And that it just helps to get the exudate up into the dressing and hold it. 
So what you can do with this dressing, I've been, uh, we've had this dressing in our H&R portfolio now for around about six years and um, a lot of feedback I get when I just ask the basic question, what do you prefer about this dressing compared to other silicon foam dressings is that for the period that it's applied to the skin, be that up to seven days, you can remove to inspect, reapply. I'm doing that the wrong way around that, reapply, remove to inspect. And over the course, over the duration it's applied to the skin, you'll find that the adhesive doesn't get stronger or weaker. So it isn't going to become more adhesive the longer you leave it on and it isn't going to potentially lose its adhesive either, which would mean it would become displaced or fall off because it's got a good moisture vapour transfer rate, which means the sweat on the skin isn't going to displace it. And also it's got a good quality silicon adhesive, which means it's unaffected by the skin conditions underneath. Bad. Thank you, Pete. That's really helpful just so that everyone can see it in action. Thank you. Right, I will just share my slides again. OK, so that's gone through um, sort of the dressing um, and sort of the application of it. Things that I just wanted to touch on, I don't think it's probably, it's not not important, but as you will have access to this and you'll be following the pathway, um, hopefully now it means that there's no sort of room for sort of going off and needing to use other things that potentially aren't recommended. I'm very aware up until now um, we've really needed something like the clinoderm foam silicone border on formulary, one, so it's easily accessible by um, staff and so it's suitable therefore as well to address the skin tears um, but up until now where that's not been available I think it's just been a lot of variation of, of what's being used out there to dress skin tears um, you know which people haven't always been left with with much more option but I do just want to go through products that really aren't recommended um, so for for some reason if um, you know you're just even passing on any learning to anyone else or you come across someone using something that's maybe not recommended just for education purposes it's good to know things that are probably going to be a bit more detrimental so um, products we would say not to use would be iodine based dressings um, the reason for this is that they actually dry the wound out and also the peri wound skin as well and that dry skin is a huge risk factor for skin tear development so that is the reason why we say not to use any iodine based dressings films and hydrocolloids um, again obviously I talked about the fact that we do have these adhesives on formulary whereas the clinoderm foam silicone border is a very gentle adhesive those films and hydrocolloids have a lot of a stronger adhesive component um, and these can contribute to medical adhesive related skin tears so we would say that they wouldn't be recommended for use on a skin tear we don't want to cause any for further trauma um, or affect that that skin flap at all skin closure strips um, again, sort of the best practice guidance um, and the skin tear advisory panel, they have experts who haven't really given a clear reason indication, but they've said that that expert opinion suggests that adhesive stereo strips are no longer a, a preferred treatment option. My assumption would be is that because, again, they have quite a strong um, adhesive component to them. And I think it's almost like forcing the flap into a play into a sort of place, really. Um, and yeah, they can be be you know especially if someone's gone to town and put loads on they can be quite difficult to remove they are very adhesive and gauze is a big no um, just because it increases the risk of flap displacement when you're changing your dressing um, and also increases the risk of skin necrosis. I would also say as well, not only that, but um, I've seen gauze sort of placed on as that primary dressing before um, straight over the top of the skin tear and it's got really stuck and it's been really difficult and painful to remove for the patient and resident. Um, so, yeah, definitely no gauze. 
okay and then just thinking about the effect that these have on patients because I just I don't think that that's something um, that you know we're that's always considered I think there's a lot of reporting with pressure damage the same reporting obviously isn't and potentially isn't possible to be done with skin tears but the idea out there is that actually skin tears are potentially just as or even more prevalent than pressure ulcers um, but because of that lack of reporting we we don't have that information available so it's just considering the impact that they have on patients and how if we suitably carry out first aid and manage them how we can make you know a positive impact so they can be very painful and distressing and affect a patient's quality of life like with any wound there is that potential for infection um, they can also increase healthcare costs because of that um, need for ongoing sort of wound management and also they can pro prolong hospitalization so hopefully with using this sort of very simple pathway but being able to adopt this first aid that's going to get your patient sort of healed quicker um, and stop these becoming complex wounds. So this was trialled, this pathway. Um, a few nursing homes did very kindly trial this because um, this piece of work started actually before COVID. But what we've been waiting on is getting the clinoderm silicone foam border on formulary officially so that I can then roll it out and tell you about the dressing um, because before then it wasn't available. But when I did pilot it, um, we had really great feedback. Everyone found the pathway was very simple and straightforward to use. Um, and as well as the dressing, it's just one dressing that goes on. The patients had good feedback as well of they found the dressing comfortable. It's sort of skin coloured, low profile. So, it, you know, it can sort of quite unnoticeable as such. Um, so, yeah, it's been it's been really um, good feedback from it. And anything that I've sort of spoken about, so I did talk about a few resources, but also this um, entire presentation, and the skin tear pathway itself is available on our website. So um, our address is there. But like I said, what the next steps will be now is Pete is coming out and he is delivering the skin tear boxes to you guys. Um, in that box will be, um, it will very clearly, I think Pete's going to hold it up, very clearly says skin tear box on the front. So you can't go wrong. You, everyone knows what it is. Um, it also has a reminder in that bottom right hand corner just about where you access the training resources. So that black writing there, it gives our website um details again to access the training resources and then inside your boxes what everyone will receive is a copy of the pathway like I mentioned that's laminated on the back is um, the stock list I believe yet yeah. so all the stock that should be in the box so it just to stop people adding unnecessary items or too much of an item in the box and then you've also got laminated guidance so that's the, the sort of the times framework I went through, but it also looks at how you classify your skin tears. And then it shows that picture of um, how you, the how you would um, draw your arrow to ensure that it's removed in the correct direction. And then dressing wise, um, just you've got your clinoderm foam silicone border in two sizes. So one box of your seven and a half by seven and a half, one box of your ten by ten. And then you've got a Sharpie pen in there so that you can arrow and date your dressing. And then Pete's also put in some rulers, which are handy um, for measuring when you're taking pictures to put initials, et cetera, on um, patient identifiable stuff. And you've got your dressing packs as well. So obviously to carry out your dressing and one is in a small to medium size, one is in a medium to large size. So Pete's very kindly providing these boxes with that stock. What we would say is um, the stock that will need replenishing i.e the dressing packs and the clinoderm foam silicone border both of those items are available for you to order on your halo systems so you'll get those boxes initially but once you've sort of run out of the stock and you're needing to replenish it it was via halo and it says that both on the side of the box on a sticker and it also reminds you of that at the bottom of the stock list as well so anyone who's who's just forgotten that is how you get it so there's no gp prescriptions we're not 
not waiting um it's audible on there and then you should sort of then have access to it um, quite freely and easily um, and we would just say to carry the one box of each size at a time we're not needing to stockpile lots of sizes um, or lots of boxes of the same size there are bigger sizes of the clinoderm foam silicone border available as well but we felt that probably you know we wouldn't need a much bigger one than that for skin tears if you've got a skin tear that's loads bigger than a 10 by 10 then it's probably quite significant so um, we didn't feel that it's something that should be included as standard in the box um fab okay has anyone got any questions i will just stop recording so that we can get to any questions uh, let me just stop Lovely. 